I'm very excited that this year uh, we invited Steve Hadley to give the lecture and in his typical collaborative and modest manner, he said, well, I'll only do it if it's actually a conversation uh, with you. And uh, then Paul Hanley, who's worked together with Steve at the in the White House uh, in the George W. Bush administration, is here for the China Forum. So we thought we would all get together and talk about uh, presidents and uh, China policy, which of course involves China, how China has changed, as well as how we in the United States um, develop our policy toward China. So the name of this lecture is a little misleading, I think. We're not really talking just about transitions. We're talking about how uh, the US government makes China policy. And um, this book is really quite remarkable. And I, I want to uh, emphasize that for me, especially since we've been spending a few days talking about China and one of the uh, problems with China, especially nowadays that we talk a lot about, is secrecy and how domestic uh, dynamics in China are certainly a kind of black box that we try, we scholars try to peek into, but it's very, very difficult. And uh, whereas this book, Handoff, is really such an impressive example of transparency which I think America should really be proud of, and not just transparency, but in this case, accountability as well, with the, uh, these senior figures from the Bush administration. Uh, and this happens pretty much in all administrations, but some are better at it than others, at uh, stepping back and looking objectively at what worked and what didn't work and why, and trying to uh, communicate those lessons to the next administration. Because in the United States, um, there really is a lot of bipartisanship in foreign policy. And certainly the foreign policy community um, People, Democrats, Republicans, we are friends, we work together, we help one another, and uh, we learn from one another. So um, this book is great and fantastic for teaching as well, because um, it has the actual transition memos, which are very succinct, actually, uh, summaries of what they tried to do and what worked and what didn't work. But in addition, the book has a, um, a bunch of memos from diplomatic meetings that Steve and others managed to declassify, and they are on a website. So you can buy the book, and then what I did, of course, because I wanted to dig deeper, I went and read some of the memcons from the actual meetings, which is, that's really fun. It's like you're in the room when uh, the president, President Hu and President Bush are talking to one another. So I encourage you to read the book and read the memcons as well. So um, I'm gonna turn to Steve and, and we're gonna get started talking about uh, the history of U.S.-China relations during this period of uh, t um, uh, 2001 to 2009, uh, President Hu Jintao, um, uh, President Bush. Uh, to set the stage, of course, we also, the, the big dramatic shock to the United States was 
Um, there were a lot of different foreign policy challenges that the Bush administration faced. Um, and I think as I read the book, I'm just really impressed with what was accomplished by the Bush administration working together with China, not just in on the bilateral relationship, but on common challenges like um, Darfur um, in Africa, uh, civil war in Africa, and of course, North Korea and the North Korean uh, nuclear uh, threat. So um, I wanted to begin by asking Steve um, what he thought really explained the uh, significant accomplishments with China, the ability to work together with China on common problems, um, and what, how would you describe uh, President Bush's approach to China? Well, <clears throat> Susan, thank you very much, and it's great to be with you uh, here tonight. Thanks for your comments by the book. The next book to it is the Overreach book, which Susan wrote, which if you haven't read, I really would commend to you. It's a, just a terrific, uh, if you want to know how we got to where we are, uh, that is the book for you. It's really terrific. We had an interesting start in the, in the Bush administration, and I think it explains in some sense the success because it was not engagement from the get-go. Uh, during the campaign, President Bush, uh, in an unprompted moment, which the staff had not vetted, candidate, presidential candidates do that all the time, said that in his view, he thought China was less a strategic partner than a strategic competitor which got a lot, raised a lot of eyebrows among the Chinese. Which is, of course, the way we talk about it today. Which is right? the way we talk about it today. Uh, we also, of course, uh, very quickly had the EP3 incident where a hot-dogging China polish, pilot hit one of our reconnaissance aircraft and forced it down in Hunan Island, held the crew for a number of days, and held the airplane for even longer. And uh, the, the backing down that was a, 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 I think, a sobering event for both the United States and Chinese, but it also, I think, sent a message to China that this was not going to be George H.W. Bush's administration in terms of China. Uh, the other third thing I would say that I think got their attention was we had a view that you approach China through your friends and allies, and they are the, they are the framework and the base from which you engage China. So when you think about going to Asia, you don't start by going to China. You go and you talk to your friends and allies, and then you go to China. That, I think, was also a bit of a difference from its predecessor administration. It got Chinese attention. And then at one point, when he was uh, briefing the press before a trip, the president was asked whether he would use military force to defend Taiwan. And he said, of course. Uh, that also got Chinese attention. People don't remember that, but that was early on in the administration. And uh, for some in the administration, and Paul can talk about this, particularly friends in the Pentagon, they loved all of that and thought we were going to have a consistent, tough line on China all the way through for the next four or eight years. But Bush really had other plans in mind, and I think it set the table in a very good way, both politically but also in terms of the mentality of the Chinese, for the president to do to pursue the policy which he did pursue, which was uh, our assessment was China was at that time uh, one a something a country that was focused on its own economic development through reform and opening up, and it needed a benign international environment to do that and pursue that successfully, and that's what they wanted. They also wanted to be part of the international system. They didn't want to disrupt it. And they clearly wanted a constructive relationship with the United States. And it appeared that those were instincts were genuine and were dictated by an assessment the Chinese had made of their own interests. And the president decided he would accept that. So we tried to bring China into the international system. 
uh, not as some concession to China, but if it was a belief that if it was part of the international system, it would support its principles, which after all are, of course, our principles of democracy, freedom, freedom, human rights, and rule of law. And it would be less likely to take actions that were inconsistent with our interests and our interests of friends and allies. So this seemed like a good bet, a good thing to try. I would say if we had not tried to do that, but had pursued a much hard line, harder line policy with respect to China kind of across the board, we'd be having a debate now about who lost China. And one of the arguments would be it was the aggressive, you know, unreconstructed Bush administration that pushed China into where it is today. I think the fact that we are as successful with our allies is making the point that our current relationship is one that China has selected uh, is very important in order to bring our friends and allies along with us to our China policy. So the president set the framework uh, and we tried to uh, bring China into the international system and develop areas where we, we could cooperate. And if you look at the transition memo, which itemizes the area of cooperation, it's quite unprecedented and something that would be hard to envision that we could do now. And we can talk about more of those details. But lastly, I would say one other thing. Um, it's, the book, I think, gives you a lot of examples of something I think which is the case, which is that in a way that I think people don't appreciate enough, the president is the strategist for his or her foreign policy. It is in the end of the day that the president who has the overall view and presidents, when they get elected, are pretty uh, ready to be president. Usually they like to make decisions. And, uh, and they will make the, those decisions. They will make, set the basic strategic direction of their administration. They are cabinet officials, and they will enable and empower to carry out that direction, turn it into policies. But I think in some sense, the quality of the strategy of any administration is a quality of the strategic thinking of the president of that administration. And this is a case where, in terms of China policy, it was really the president who laid out the framework. So that's really interesting because in some other areas, there appear to be more internal uh, disagreement. And from the standpoint of people outside the government, they were observing that, so that the so-called neocons had uh, hijacked a lot of foreign policies. So it, it was really interesting to see that that didn't happen with China policy. And that became particularly vivid to those of us outside the government in 2003, when uh, President Bush welcomed the premier of China, Wen Jiabao. And this was a time that um, Taiwan had a uh, kind of pro-independence uh, president, Chen Shui-bian, who had scheduled a referendum uh, in Taiwan. And now the subject of the referendum was pretty anodyne, but it kind of set the precedent for holding referenda in Taiwan, which one day might be, should Taiwan be a sovereign independent country, which would have really put the United States in a very difficult position. So, um, and meanwhile, we have 9-11, the war on terrorism, Chen Shui-bian is holding referenda, and President Bush stands up next to Wen Jiabao and says um, that we oppose any unilateral changes to the status quo by either side, which um, was a pretty bold thing to do. One of, the, one of the things that made the policy work, and I'll do the Taiwan thing in a minute, uh, was that it was a balanced policy. So at the same time, the president was trying to engage China, bring it into the international s system, establish a constructive relationship with China. We were hedging our bets. We were also working with our allies in Japan, South Korea, Australia, Philippines, Thailand, to strengthen our defense relationships with them and to strengthen their own uh, posture in the region. 
so that for two reasons. One, we thought that would be a context. What, one, it was good to do in its own, it, own right. It's something we owed our allies to do. Two, it would provide a context in which it would give China an incentive to try to have establish a constructive good relationship with us. But also it would give us a hedge that if in fact this did not work and China became, quite frankly, the kind of China it is today, we would have a platform from which to manage that China that would summon not only our own resources, but those resources of our friends and allies. So it was the balance in the policy, I think, that was part of its success and also made it a little hard to attack. Similarly on Taiwan, you think about that, he's uh, talked about how uh, China is a strategic competitor, not a strategic partner. He's prepared to use force to defend Taiwan if invaded by China. Uh, at the same time, he made it clear that we did not support Chinese, Taiwanese independence, notwithstanding the pretensions of Chen Shui-bian. Uh, and he also articulated this principle about no unilateral change in the status quo, which became a fundamental piece of American policy and is still a fundamental That's piece right. of American policy today. So I think it was this mix of tough, but also willing to engage that, that it accounted for the fact that the policy turned out to be as robust as it did. Paul, you, you have a different yeah. view on that? No, I think that's exactly right. Um, and I had an opportunity to work in the Pentagon before I came over to work for you in the National Security Council. Um, and I had a chance to see kind of both sides, that engagement side um, and the balancing and the hedging side. Um, and I, I got the sense at the time that, you know, President Bush saw both opportunities with China, but also challenges. I don't think people say he was naive. I don't think he was naive about China at all. I think he understood China's a Marxist-Leninist system, and it could evolve in ways that are inimical to US interests, and therefore, we need to invest in our allies. Of course, the Quad was developed in the Bush administration in 2004. Even today, that remains an important part of our balancing and hedging against China. When I was in the Pentagon, um, I, I had the Taiwan account. Uh, so I traveled to Taiwan often, and we worked to fulfill our obligations in the Taiwan Relations Act. We had a big arms sales package right at the beginning of the administration that Rich Armitage uh, got through the State Department. And part of it was to make that strong statement of support for Taiwan, but get the arms sale package off the table up front in the administration rather than making it an annual irritant, which right. it had been. We did a big package up front, made the point, and that kind of cleared the decks for us to be able to engage with China. But I think the um, to have the president stand next to Premier Wen Jiabao and, in effect, tell Chen Shui-bian that uh, the United States would not welcome a unilateral action to change the status quo from Taiwan really provided the kind of assurance that is always part of deterrence. So what's interesting is after that, Hu Jintao uh, pursues a much more peaceful approach to Taiwan. He, um, and of course, then he had a, a KMT president in Taiwan to work together with, Mind Zhou, and that was the period where they did the three links right. and economic integration to try to, from their standpoint, prevent Taiwan independence, but do it through peaceful economic and right. social ties. Part of it is also how you deal with China. And one of the things that was interesting, if you listen to Kurt Campbell over the last couple of days, the administration is moving forward with a number of initiatives to strengthen our friends and allies relations with our friends and allies, as we did in the Bush administration. But he made the point that we are letting the Chinese know in advance that we're doing it. And that is really important because nobody likes surprises. And Bush internalized that in a way, and I'll just say one little story, but he was meeting with Hu Jintao probably 2007 uh, at a G7 summit, I think, or no, a G20 summit. In Australia. Uh, but in any event, um, he sat down at the end and they had a good conversation. He said to President Hu, I've got some good news and some bad news. Which would you like first? 
And President Hu, being no fool, said, I'll take the good news first. And so he said, well, I'm coming to the Beijing Olympics. I'm going to stay for a number of days. And I'm bringing my whole family. And this was very important because, as you remember, there was an incipient boycott of the uh, Beijing Olympics that was beginning to build. And Bush's public statement to that sort of put the kibosh on that. Uh, so Hu Jintao, being no fool, was delighted. And he gets up to leave. And the president says, wait a minute. Now I got to tell you the bad news. So he, he sits down and, and he says, uh, next week I'm going to go up to Capitol Hill. I'm going to give the Dalai Lama the congressional gold medal. <laughs> And Hu Jintao said, oh, Mr. President, the great Chinese people will not understand. He says, I know they won't understand, but I got to do it, and I wanted you to hear it from me first. And I think that kind of being very candid and straightforward, standing up for your views, but not surprising, treat people with respect, even as you do things they're not going to like, is a good, I think, way to sort of summarize the right kind of approach for dealing with So I, I want- Can I just say an addendum on this? The other added benefit of this was as the China director, of course, the Chinese embassy immediately came over to the White House to demarche me and my colleagues and say how terrible it was. And all we had to say was, I think our two presidents have talked about this. Yeah. So we got nothing to discuss. But that was very nice. I appreciate it. But it, it, it also <laughs> highlights the importance of the personal relationship between the leaders and the communication between the leaders. Yep. That's another <laughs> takeaway that I got from reviewing the history of that period. And President Bush was fantastic at developing that kind of relationship with Hu Jintao. And I can, uh, I'll just quote one thing that came from a MEMCON that I think people would find very interesting. Um, Bush actually said to Hu Jintao, we don't want our relations to be upset by unilateral moves by anyone, including Taiwan. I want to help manage this situation. Um, so send me a personal message if you are worried or agitated. It would be much worse if you took unilateral action. Just pick up the phone if you think something is out of kilter, and we will talk. There was a lunch that he had with Hu Jintao, and he and Condi Rice, who was Secretary of State at the time, conspired for how to isolate Hu from those around him. And we got it at the table so that it was Hu, the president, translator, and Condi. And Bush says to him, you know, what keeps you up at night? I, kept, I, I kept, am kept up at night by the risk of a terrorist attack on the United States. What keeps you up at night? And he said something like this, and I, I, there are various versions, but he said something like this. Every year, I have to create another 35 million new jobs. That's what keeps me up at night. Now, you can say, you know, does that say much? But, but I thought the fact that you can get that kind of leader-to-leader -leader communication and conversation is, a, is, a, is an important element of our relations with our other countries. So let's talk about uh, today. Uh, I mean, I think it's important. Uh, what This book is uh, a wonderful read because it's important for us to remember uh, the kind of relationship we had with China at that time. And uh, because nowadays, it's kind of hard to imagine that kind of relationship today. So what has changed in your view? And, um, and do you think we could ever restore that kind of um, trust between the leaders? Yeah. So I'll take a whack at that. Susan said this one was coming. Uh, <laughs> there are, um, we did a lot of cooperation with China on counterterrorism, on counterproliferation policy more generally, on Iran, on North Korea. Uh, we helped uh, establish the CDC in China, 
We got them to participate in the major economy member meetings uh, and uh, very an Asia Pacific uh, climate and clean development initiative, which over time caused the Chinese to drop this notion that they can't be held to account for climate change or remedying it or preventing it because they're a developing country and this is a problem with the developed countries. Well, we finally got them to drop that and to accept some responsibility for participating with the international community in those things. We, got, we did cooperation with them on peacekeeping, on Darfur. I mean, it was a very robust agenda. And the question Susan put to me was, is, is that off the table or could we return to some of that? And my answer would be this, and, and Paul and Susan may have a different one. I think the, the administration actually has framed this pretty well. Look, it's going to be a more competitive relationship. There's no doubt about it. Uh, there are going to be areas where we're going to agree to disagree. We're going to continue to talk about human rights and religious freedoms and all the rest, and the Chinese are going to continue to hate it. And they're going to have some things they're going to do that we're going to be very unhappy about. But the administration has said, look, let's, let's have three buckets where we're going to be basically adversaries, where we're going to compete, and in that bucket, let's try to manage the competition so it doesn't drive us into confrontation and conflict. And then there's areas where we can cooperate. And the ones I've described would fall into that bucket. I think that's a very sensible way to do it. The Chinese reaction has been, well, why should we cooperate with you if you aren't addressing some of those areas where we compete or some of the things that we do, do that, that, that we hate? And the answer is simple, of course. Those areas in cooperation are not favors to the United States, but they're in China's own interests. But for the moment, China is into hostage taking and is holding cooperation hostage to resolution of some of those other issues. Now, I think one of the objectives of the administration in this very good effort of engagement and the long meetings that have been that the uh, Secretary of State, National Security Advisor, the Treasury Secretary have had is it may be loosening the Chinese up a little bit in that respect. And if they would be willing to de-link, you could begin to talk about cooperation. I think the administration is also wise in talking about let's start small. Let's take small steps, build, show some things that can actually produce results, produce a little trust and confidence. So let's talk people to people. Let's talk about visas. Let's talk about, you know, number of air flights between our two countries and the like. I think that's the right approach. And the question, though, is whether China will get to the point where they're willing to play on that field. I think they should, but so far they haven't. Paul, you have a different view? No, that, that, that sounds right to me. I, I, you know, it's, it's very interesting because, you know, clearly the Chinese are competing aggressively with us. There's no doubt about that. Clearly they're confronting us in areas where they think we're undermining their interests, right? So they're taking a very similar approach, but what they're not doing is cooperating, which is something that they've called for, for for many years. I think a lot of it has to do with their own domestic politics and, and frankly, where the leadership has positioned the United States, very hostile. Um, in the March National People's Congress, I mean, President Xi, for the first time, called out the United States um, as uh, trying to encircle and contain uh, China, and that they need to take a you know have a fighting spirit and and push back. So, I think that explains some of why they couldn't accept the Biden administration reaching out for dialogue. How do you engage in dialogue if if this is your you know increasingly your adversary? So I think it and and the Biden administration deserves some credit because they take political hits at home for reaching out for dialogue, and as the Republicans say, you're looking very desperate. Um, yeah. But it will take, I think, Xi Jinping and the leadership to prepare the domestic politics for that kind of engagement. And you know, I think the Biden administration will have to continue on with those efforts, reaching out for dialogue, trying to cooperate on issues of global interest, uh, where global public goods are, are uh, at and risk. One shouldn't underestimate the political costs. I mean, uh, the, there was an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal that basically made the case that given Chinese recalcitrance, any effort and engagement, even meeting with the Chinese, was equivalent of appeasement. So the political environment in Washington makes it very tough 
but the Biden administration knew what, it, uh, what it's doing. Okay, so let's talk about, talk about the future, um, where the presidential campaign has already begun, and um, how difficult do you think it will be to uh, for the Biden administration to use diplomacy to try to make progress on issues of concern with China. President um, Xi is supposed to come to the United States for the APEC meeting in California um, in November. And uh, clearly, he would really like to come. He would like to have it be a successful visit. He doesn't want uh, large numbers of loud protesters uh, surrounding his entourage and uh, reflecting a kind of hostile attitude. Does that create an incentive for him to moderate his policies at all? I think a little bit. Uh, I think it's much more what Dan Rosen and the others in the panel that we had. He's got a, he's got, he, she has domestic economic problems and social problems that are considerable. And he needs some time to address them. And he in some sense needs to be a little out from under the pressure to give him that time to do so. So I think it has a lot more to do with that um, on the other hand, President Biden, of course, is going into his own election, and he doesn't want a blow up or a confrontation with China going into the election. Um, so I think both countries at this point, and both leaders have an incentive to put some kind of ballast under the relationship, put some stability under the relationship, reestablish communication links, which they've done. And I think they may be able to define an carry and execute some of these small steps I talked about. But I don't think you're gonna see anything big until after our election. Um, one, because Xi Jinping doesn't know, as people say, was, was President Trump the anomaly or was President Biden the anomaly? And if you're gonna see a return of Trumpism in 2024, which I suspect the Chinese are fairly ambivalent about it. You can, make, you can argue that round or square. But in any event, why make major concessions or take major risks with, for someone who may be out of office after January of 2025? Uh, so I, I think on the Chinese side, there, is, there were small steps at best, but trying to avoid a crisis. And in terms of President Biden, I think Given his political context, the last thing you want, given the temperament in Washington, is to have someone get to your right, political right, on the issue of China. So I think the likelihood that Biden would, would take the risk of a major innovation before presidential election, I think, is fairly small. So there is, we're going to open it up to the floor uh, after this question. So be thinking of what you'd like to ask. Um, you know, there's a, a kind of, um, I wouldn't say fever, it's more fear, anxiety about war now uh, than I remember seeing ever actually in US-China relations. Um, mostly related to the risk of Beijing taking uh, military steps against Taiwan. So what's your view about, there are, a lot, there are quite a number of American uh, generals who are saying, you know, it could happen very soon. You know, on the Chinese side, there are plenty of people also saying, the third term, Xi Jinping wanted a third term because he wants to uh, establish his historical legacy as a great leader by reunifying with Taiwan during the third term. So um, what's your perspective on that? So it's, it's And mixed. I'm gonna ask you too, Paul. It's mixed. Um, as one of our 
panelists pointed out, she supposedly, our intelligence community tells us, Bill Burns tells us, that he has said that he wants his military to be in a position to be able to take Taiwan militarily and manage a U.S. response by 2027. Interesting enough, John G. Min said the same thing and wanted it to be in a position to do that by 2008. But Hu Xintao decided that time was more on their side and, and so that order kind of stood down. But you have to take that order seriously. Um, I th my guess is political leaders, even strong political leaders like Xi Jinping, won't initiate hostilities unless their military says to them, we're ready and we can handle the blow blast. And that suggests that one of our strategies ought to be to so strengthen our posture in the region, the posture of our friends and allies in the region, and strengthen the deterrence and resilience of Taiwan so that every time Xi Jinping brings in his military and say, can I take Taiwan and the Americans now? They say, well, Mr. President, we need another couple of years. I mean, that would be success. Secondly, um, I do think there is an underappreciation of what war with China over Taiwan would look like and the costs that would, would be entailed. And I think someone said that this morning in our, or this afternoon in our, among our panels. I wouldn't want to dwell on it. So for example, there is a poll out, and I've, I've got the numbers I'll use for the panel tomorrow. Something like 67% of the American people think they ought to go ahead and recognize Taiwan. Hey, why not? Well, you know, there are a lot of really good reasons Meaning why the not. formal independence of Taiwan. Recognition of Taiwan, which undermines the whole fundamental assumption underlying the establishment of U.S.-China relations in, in 1979. And if you believe Xi Jinping, the risk of war would be very high, and the consequences of that war would be catastrophic for everybody, especially Taiwan. I don't dwell on that because I don't want to become self-deterred from doing the things we need to do in terms of strengthening our own posture, that of our friends and allies, and the resilience and capabilities of the Taiwanese, because it's those measures that will deter the conflict and keeping it from happening. So I, I worry we don't appreciate enough what's at stake here, if you talk loosely about a war with China, but I don't want that concern to get in the way of doing the very things that we need to do to deter the possibility of a war with China. But it's that combination of deterrence and assurance, such as President Bush uh, engaged in, right? I mean, yep. because we also could provoke, it's kind of, if we, if our Congress did take some legislation to recognize Taiwan as an independent country, that might, uh, kind of force Xi Jinping. It could we have to be, we have, we have a tendency Americans to do things rhetorically and symbolically and representationally uh, that make us feel good but don't actually change the, the strategic right. situation on the ground. I worry that we do those kinds of politically attractive things with respect to Taiwan, uh, but, uh, but uh, don't do the, the real work that is required in order uh, to deter. Right. Uh, that's what I would be concerned. And there's another thing we haven't talked about, which Phil Zelko has wrote the Philip Zelko has written the book on, which is an economic strategy for deterring Thai, uh, China over Taiwan. That also also be, ought to be an element of what we're talking about. We, we tend to overemphasize the military piece. Paul, would you like to? No, I think obviously we've spent a lot of time the last couple of days talking about the importance of deterrence, um, and I think that's an absolute key. You've got to make sure that. Solid. It's solid, and and you know it, the idea is if they make a move to uh, reunify with Taiwan through military force, that they may not be successful. But your point on assurances is also important too. It may be that Xi Jinping actually feels as though he's losing control of the Taiwan situation. One, the fact that he tells his military they need to have options by 2027 means they don't have options today. Second, you know, the Hong Kong situation has convinced most Taiwanese that the one country, two systems right. concept is not going to work 
and the political identity of Taiwanese is becoming much more Taiwanese. And I'm sure Xi Jinping and the leadership are aware of these trends. And so you don't want Xi Jinping to come to the conclusion, I've got to do something now. And that's where the assurance piece comes in. He needs to know that what the United States is for is peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. And ultimately, what we have said our policy is, is if Taiwan and the mainland are able to work something out, as long as it's not under duress or coercion, then we would be okay with that. And if President Xi feels that he's got time to work this thing out, then there's less likelihood he's gonna take military action. There'll be a new election for new president of right. Taiwan in January of 2024, and who wins will be very telling because the KMT is once again posturing themselves as the party of peace that knows how to manage China without risk of war, and the DPP candidate and a third candidate have a little bit different approach. <laughs> okay, we have time uh, for a few questions. Uh, please raise your hand. Uh, Clara. We have a microphone coming your way. Um, well, thanks for your comments. Um, I think you mentioned that, I, it sounds from what Paul said that um, you think that um, China in large part is responsible for the t deterioration in, in um, US-China relations. Although if you took a poll, I wonder, you know, like half and half or 30, 70 might, I think that there'd be some, um, just some conflicts or not so much consensus. So I'd, I'd love to hear how you think the US has been responsible for the deterioration. And then I have this other question about strategic ambiguity. Okay, just one okay, question. Sorry. That's one of my principles. One question for the floor. Okay. Um, yeah. No, I think, I mean, <clears throat> we, we do lay it out in the book, you know, as, as uh, as was mentioned, I also stayed on in the Obama administration. And, and uh, one of the things they said to me at the end of the Bush administration when they asked me if I would stay on is, you know, we were critical of Bush's foreign policy, but don't tell anybody we actually think that the Bush administration did a good job on China policy and we want to build on the progress that was made. They never told me that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, you know, if you ask the question that way, of course, I'll stay on. Um, and, and they did approach it in a very similar way. Uh, engaging, trying to build cooperation on a range of issues, but also balancing and uh, hedging. They grew frustrated at the end of the Obama administration because of a number of things, South China Sea Island building, cyber theft of intellectual property, and the inability to address trade and economic issues to any satisfaction. And they started at the end of the Obama administration to really have a shift in their policy. It wasn't Donald Trump that came in uh, brand new, out of, the bolt, out of the blue. It was the Obama administration was growing frustrated. So I do think, and there was some disappointment uh, in the US that that sort of approach wasn't able to be possible. Where I think we fell short is our own problems at home, the global financial crisis. For China looked up to the United States uh, in terms of its economic system. Um, and I think we lost a lot of credibility in Chinese eyes uh, with the global financial crisis are increasingly polarized and, and populist uh, politics. Um, the January 6th, you know, insurrection on Capitol Hill. I think these, that convinces Chinese that the United States is in decline. And you have a, at a period where China is very ambitious. Um, and then they get much more confidence in their own system and move out in a very different direction. So I think we do have, you know, things that we have you know, failures on our own part, missteps, it has a lot to do with our own domestic situation, which I think is really critical in getting that in order and have in order to have a good, successful China policy. I'd say one thing, though. It, it is a lesson, I think, that who leads these countries really matters. And that presidents, uh, if they are strong presidents, really can uh, take their country in a new direction. And, and I think the contrast between Hu Jintao, John Zemin, and Xi Jinping is pretty remarkable. And Susan, in her book, in a section at the front, talks about Hu Jintao sort of losing control of the collective leadership and falling prey to factionalism that actually put his 
took his policy in a direction he didn't want to go. But Xi Jinping sort of hid his intent and bided his time. And when he got the brass ring and became president and general secretary, he had a different view, different view of the world. As Paul said, US in decline, West in decline. This is China's moment to step forward. Hide your power, bide your time is old think. It was gonna be a much more aggressive policy. And you see it across the board, we can elaborate it. But I think the point is he had a different vision for his country, took it in a different direction. And my own view, and Susan is the expert here, probably will say it's wrong. But if you had had, instead of a Xi Jinping, another John Zemin like president for another 10 years, I think uh, we would be in a different place. I think China would be in a different place, and I think US-China relations would be a different, different place. Now, there are a lot of other factors here, but I just want to put on the table that leaders matter in these kinds of decisions. And leaders create certain types of institutions to make decisions and create incentives for the other politicians, right. which you know, uh, contribute right. to making mistakes, as Deng Xiaoping said. It must Bonnie. have been a good question because it took a long time yeah. for us to answer it, so. <laughs> okay, uh, Bonnie. I think one of the best speeches that has been given um, on China policy was during the Bush administration. Of course, it's what we call the responsible stakeholder speech. Oh, yeah that Bob Zelik uh, yeah. gave. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what, what prompted the administration to deliver the messages that it did. You know, it's often mischaracterized. People forget what it actually said. <laughs> uh, and do you, what, what impact um, did it have at the time? Um, it, was, it, it's, it, it was really an important moment, I think, in the US-China relationship. So if um, either you, Steve, or Paul could elaborate on it, that would be great. So uh, I don't remember clearing Bob Zelik's speech. <laughs> that, that doesn't surprise you, surprise you or me knowing Bob Zelik. So that one's on Condi. But I think uh, it was a, you know, Bob's a very important member of that administration. And I think he, uh, he got the China policy. And I think it was a very useful articulation. Unfortunately, people sort of cherry pick it hold it up now in the current context and say how naive it was. Whereas if you put that speech in the context of the policy that, I, that Paul and I have described, it's very much, I think, in the, in the direction that the president was, was heading. But can you just quick summarize what you, for the people who don't remember? I'm gonna let uh, Paul uh, handle Okay. It. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say one thing. Um, China was becoming a, power, very influential power, not just regionally, but globally. And our, as you know, Bonnie, our relationship was moving from simply a bilateral relationship and dealing with bilateral issues to one in which we were dealing with issues where China had influence on a global set of issues. I remember being the China director and writing a memo for the president to use in the Oval with a phone call or a meeting with a Chinese official and I would have you know, Mike Singh from the Iran office come over and say, hey, you've got to have this in your memo. Uh, somebody from the nonproliferation office coming over, you've got to get this in your memo. The climate change people, and the memo is getting longer and longer and longer. And I realized you know, China is <laughs> growing in, in its influence. And President Bush felt that we should try. We should give it a chance to enhance cooperation with China on those issues where China was now in a position to contribute. And, that if we could do it and we could do it successfully, it could have positive effect on the overall bilateral relationship. You know, when Steve said I could go down and be the China director, he, on the way down, he said, oh, we're gonna give you the six party talks account. And I said, no, I don't want that. But he gave it to me anyways. Um, and it made sense at the time because we were working closely with the Chinese. Yeah. Um, and the other anecdote that I remember about President Bush and the personal relationship is when President Hu Jintao came for a White House visit and he did the same thing. He pulled President uh, Hu aside uh, and President Hu's team was very nervous because it was just Bush and Condi and the interpreter and President Hu. 
And he told him, uh, this was uh, April 2006, he said, I want to get back to the negotiating table with the North Koreans, uh, but they're holding out. And I'll tell you, and this is, I wasn't there, but this is what I was told. If you can convince the North Koreans to get back to the table and the United States makes an agreement, we'll stick to that agreement. You have my word. And they sent Tang Jashuan the next day to Pyongyang. Yeah. Uh, and then the North Koreans eventually came back to the table. So that was kind of the kind of cooperation that we, we had. And I think President Bush was really trying to play that out to see how far we could get with that. He thought that was very important. That was a visit where we welcomed the Chinese president by playing the Taiwanese national oh, anthem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was not my responsibility to pick the music. And where a young woman stood up and started screaming at Hu Jintao, and it took about four minutes, which seemed like about four hours for the security services to pull oh, out. So no. Hu Jintao was fairly forgiving for that during yeah. that visit. Can I just say that was before I was the China director? <laughs> but I think, um, I think that approach of trying to uh, let China know that it could realize its ambitions as a, an international leader. And part of it. Uh, in a positive way. Yeah. That you don't have to realize ambitions by being aggressive. You can do it by working together with other countries and providing public goods. Like, yeah, and the, um, the North Korea story, reading the book and re remembering about the six party talks, which of course was convened by China. Um, Wang Yi was very engaged in that and he is now the senior foreign policy uh, leader politician in China. The, now he's both the foreign minister and the um, uh, President Xi's main foreign policy advisor. So, um, you know, those kinds of positive initiatives, we work together remarkably well. We got the North Koreans to do a lot. They agreed on a September 17th, 2005 agreement to basically give up their nuclear program. Not just the military program, civilian program as well. Uh, but we couldn't nail it down, we couldn't get it verified, and we couldn't hold them in it. Yeah, so, I mean, in the end, maybe it, it was a failure, yep. but it was a worthwhile failure. And I think, I mean, I certainly uh, am a supporter of that kind of initiative because people in China saw that the United States was open to working together with China on these problems, which reflected a certain goodwill. Um, which in the long run, in the long game, may actually matter quite a bit. So, okay, um, wrap it up, huh? I'm really sorry, uh, we have to conclude. Um, it was a wonderful conversation. Um, Those who still had questions, come on up. Yeah, and yeah, we'll we, can, we can chat now, um, and thanks so much. Steve and Paul uh, for sharing your experiences with us and for this wonderful book. So thank you. Thank you.